Hello and welcome back. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, and yeah, we're on to our final talk and I would like to welcome Alex Hidalgo, who's joining us from New York. Thanks so much Thanks for having me. Hi, Alex. So it's actually early for you, right? Yeah, it's about 2 p.m. over here, but uh, happy yeah. to be here. And this is probably my last thing for the day. I'm going to go on a walk after this, so... Nice. Okay. <laughs> well, here the sun is slowly setting. Uh, so this is the last thing I'm doing for today as well. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, Alex. And we just found out while uh, talking to each other that we both didn't start out in tech. We started out in restaurants, actually. Yeah. And I'll actually be touching on that a little bit. Um, yeah. My talk starts off with a story about working in a restaurant. So. That's amazing. I'm really excited. I have loads of stories about that as well. <laughs> okay, Alex, you're going to talk to us about SLOs for everyone. We've talked a little bit about SLOs today, and we're going to have a cool talk by you. I'm very excited. Everyone, please, if you have any questions for Alex during the talk, throw them into the chat. You know the deal. You know how that works. Also, don't forget our hashtag, WTFSSRE, uh, to tweet about us. And then let's move into our final talk on this track. Thank you. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you. All right, everyone. I want to start off this talk about SLOs for everyone with just a little story. So if you'll permit me at first, uh, let's go back in time a little bit. It's November of 2003. Uh, I'm a server in a fairly busy Italian restaurant. And restaurants are hard work, uh, especially if you work at a busy one. Um, everyone has to coordinate. Uh, it's truly a complex system with many component complex systems. The kitchen has to interact with the floor, the floor being the servers, etc. And you need to make sure that you're working with the maitre d' and the hosts to ensure that people are being seated correctly. And you often have to order drinks from the bar. The bar often operates entirely independently of the rest of the restaurant. And there's just a lot going on and it can get very hectic. And in fact, I've talked to lots of other people in the industry who used to work in the restaurant industry, and everyone I've ever talked to about this, they all agree it's like managing an incident every night. You go to work, and it's essentially, we're going to have an incident, we're implementing some form of the incident command system, right? We have the brigade system, we have, we have our hierarchies, and we're just going to figure this out together. But at this particular time, we were dealing with a lot of unhappy customers. Something had kind of broken down in our communications. Something had broken down in the way the restaurant was working with it, uh, all the different components of the restaurant, how they were working with each other. And this is a particularly bad time because the holidays were coming up. And just like retail, the busiest time of the year for most restaurants is the holiday season. It might seem counterintuitive to some people because these seasons are also known for when people gather in people's homes and people cook great meals. But it's also true that some of the busiest days of the year are the night before Thanksgiving in the U.S. or the night before Christmas because people are in town already, but people don't want to cook these grand meals multiple nights in a row. So the holiday season is really important and things get really busy. And unhappy customers will kill your business. I don't think this is an outrageous claim, right? If people aren't satisfied with the service that you're providing them, they're going to go elsewhere. So we got together some of the head servers and the managers and the chefs, and, and we said, look, what if we set some targets? What if we start measuring things? We need some metrics here. Uh, we need to make sure that we're providing the right level of service for our customers, but we also don't want to burn people out because that's what we're doing right now. Whatever was happening, whatever the disconnect was, uh, all the employees felt completely overworked, yet we still weren't able to provide the right levels of service to our unhappy customers. So we set some measurable goals. And to be honest, it's been 20 years. I can't remember if these were the actual times we set. And that's not really important. The important point is we these are the kind of things we started tracking. And we didn't track them at a very granular level. We didn't have someone standing there with a stopwatch or anything like that, but we still set these kind of general goals. Once a table was seated, we want to make sure that within two minutes, the server at least stopped by to say hi and perhaps get their drink order. And if they were able to get their drink order, we hoped that the server was able to get their drinks onto the table within about five minutes. And then we hoped that appetizers would make it out of the kitchen within 10 minutes after being ordered and so on and so on. 
again, these were general goals and we didn't time them super specifically, but it, it was a way for us to start thinking, how can we ensure that our customers are being served in the way that they expect? And we also set realistic targets along with this. We didn't expect uh, every single table to be greeted within two minutes because sometimes that this simply wasn't possible. Again, at the peak of a Friday night at 7.30 p.m. where every table has been sat and we're on our second rotation of every single table being sat and we have enough guests uh, waiting uh, to sit down for the next rotation, we knew we wouldn't be able to hit these uh, goals every single time. So we said things like, okay, four out of five customers will be greeted within two minutes, et cetera, et cetera. And this helped us identify problems when we started realizing, okay, the drinks weren't making it onto the table on time. Maybe the food was showing up uh, in an appropriate uh, manner after being ordered. But if you sit down and your first impression of a restaurant is you don't get your drink for 10 minutes, that's not great. So we staffed a second bartender. We realized that the bar was getting more backed up than we realized, and we needed a second person there to ensure that dr drinks, especially mixed drinks and beers and wines, were all making it out in time. And then we also realized that customers were not getting greeted in time because our host at the time was not properly trained, and they were seating too many customers in the same section too often. And it's actually better uh, for a customer to wait a bit uh, than to be seated and not greeted. So we had to retrain the hosts and say, look, even if you have this guest and you have this open table, make them wait in the lobby for a few minutes so that by the time you seat them for the server, they have time to greet them in a reasonable manner. And once we started measuring things in this way, uh, once we identified some of the problems, once we were able to resolve some of the problems, the service issues improved drastically. And we noticed customers were happier and tips went up and everything that goes along with it because happy customers equals a happy business. Hi, my name is Alex Hidalgo. Uh, I'm the Principal Reliability Advocate at Noble9, and uh, I spent most of my 20s working in the service industry. So I wanna go back to this kind of quote, this, this hyperbolic quote of, of what we did when we realized that we were having problems. We said, let's set measurable targets for our levels of service so we don't burn out, but still keep people happy. And let's examine this phrase a bit. So let's remove some of it and kind of focus on the meat of this quote, which is targets for our level of service. And let's replace targets with objectives and let's remove a few more words and then let's rearrange the words and we get service level objectives. We were a restaurant in 2002 using service level objectives before the term was ever really invented in the way we use it today, before it ever became popular in tech, because it turns out that service level objectives are for everyone. And a lot of industries are already doing them, whether or not they know it. So what are SLOs, service level objectives? I'm gonna do a very brief introduction. I think a lot of people attending the talk today probably have some kind of idea, but in case people don't, let me run through it real quick. The basic idea is you have these three service reliability principles. Uh, one, reliability is the most, most important feature of your service. If you are not being reliable, your service, and now we're talking about computer services, uh, people aren't going to be happy with it. They're not going to use it. Uh, it doesn't matter if you think you have perfect uptime and uh, for your logs and, and your metrics say that everything's fine. Um, if your users aren't happy, then you're not being reliable. And that's the second point. Your users determine what reliable means. Reliability hinges upon your service doing what the users of it need it to do. And the final principle that's very important as well is to embrace the fact that nothing works all the time. So don't try for it. Don't aim for 100% because you'll never actually get there. Pick a more reasonable target instead. And the way you do this with SLOs is what I've dubbed the reliability stack. So at the bottom, you have SLIs or service level indicators. And the service level indicator is just a measurement um, uh, to tell you how your service is operating at a certain point in time. And it's very important that it measures your service from your user's perspective. Because as we just said, it doesn't matter how you think so think things are running. If your users aren't happy, if things aren't running well from their perspective, then you're not being reliable. The next part of the reliability stack is SLOs. So the, the meets the, the commonly used term for this entire approach, service level objectives or SLOs. They're essentially just a target percentage informed by an SLI. 
So how often is our SLI telling us that things are being reliable versus times that it's telling us that things are not? And again, the other thing an SLO lets you do is it lets you pick a more reasonable target because 100% is just never going to happen. And then finally, at the top, we have error budgets. And error budgets is just a way of calculating how your SLOs performed uh, over some window of time. Um, this can be 28 days, 30 days, a quarter. Some people use rolling windows. Some people use calendar calendar aligned windows. Uh, it really all depends on what your service looks like. But the point is, um, use your SLO data to also tell you how you've performed over time as opposed to how you're performing right now. Okay, that quick introduction is over. Let's continue with our talk about how SLOs are for everyone. So I want to go back to these three service reliability principles. Reliability is the most important feature of your service. Your users determine what reliable means and nothing works all the time. And what I want to kind of draw home here is SLOs are really just a philosophy. They're an approach. And for computer services, especially request and response APIs and a lot of the things that we deal with as SRE on a day-to-day -day basis, they can be informed very well by metrics and math and things like that. But SLOs are really just an approach. And you don't always need the complicated math. It's absolutely great if you can measure uh, a full user journey through, you know, how often the checkout button on your retail website works versus when it errors out. Uh, and that's complicated. You need a lot of math. You need a lot of monitoring. You need the proper observability in your, into your systems to be able to do this. But SLOs in general, it's really just a philosophy that you can apply to everything. And we're going to go through through some dic dictionary definitions here. Um, I don't always love this. I definitely don't love the uh, the essay that starts off with the dictionary defines this term as. But I do also think that using the way words are actually defined can help us communicate better. Um, this will be coming from Oxford because it's what Google results give you and was easiest to find. So let's go through our three different principles and let's talk a bit about how they can apply to many different things and not just what you normally think of applying SLOs to today. So reliability is the most important feature of your service, right? As we just said, if your service isn't reliable, it's not really worth anything, but this can apply to any role, any organization, any business, not just our web services. So let's drill down. What is the definition of a service? Even just the colloquial definition actually tells us a lot. A service is the action of helping or doing work for someone. That's exactly what our computer services do. Um, but it's also what so many other things do. You have so many services. And there's a lot of things within your own company that you can be using SLOs for to make them more reliable and make them more efficient that you may not have thought about before. So... Let's start off with computer services. And, you know, I'm not going to touch on the web APIs and that we generally think about, but there's so many other things that are also services. They are also providing a, a, a service for someone. They, they are completing a task for someone. And there's things like build pipelines, uh, your business processing systems, uh, even things like your ticketing systems. Do you have SLOs set on how often Jira is working correctly? Uh, your customer relation relationship management software. This is something else that has to be reliable. Your sales team is going to have a real difficult time uh, communicating with your customers if they don't have this up and running. And, you know, that drives your entire business. If you're not making sales, uh, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, things like your user desktops and laptops. How are your employees? Anywhere from engineers to customer service to your sales team to marketing. How can they get their jobs done if their operating systems aren't working well or your internal software isn't working well? And this goes all the way down to like the networking gear that may be present either in your offices or your data centers. The point is just that there's a lot of things that we can define as computer services that people generally don't set SLOs on. And there's really no reason why you can't. But there's a lot of other services you likely have as well that aren't computer services at all. You have your customer support team. They're providing a service to your customers. How efficient are they? Are you measuring whether or not they are providing the right level of support? Maybe they don't have the right training. Maybe they're overloaded. Maybe you don't have enough customer support people. These are all things that you can discover if you were to set an SLO on it. Because no matter what, that's not going to be perfect either. And that's fine because nothing's ever perfect, but you can measure these things better. How's your internal IT team doing? 
right? Are, are requests for laptops being fixed or specialized software being installed or even things like uh, exceptions to install software that's not normally allowed but is strictly required for a certain person? You know, how quickly are those being resolved? Are they being resolved correctly? Uh, are tickets being closed, marked as done when actually they aren't? You likely deal with a lot of vendors. Um, are the vendors doing their job? Um, you can also measure this better if you were just to set a target, right? First define an SLI. What do you expect this vendor to do? And then say, how often would it be okay if this vendor isn't able to complete their task correctly? Because just like everyone else, even someone you're paying, they're not going to be able to be 100%. And again, that's fine. Even thing like your facilities team. Are they overloaded? Are they able to get their jobs done in time? When people, if you're in an office and you know it's way too cold or way too hot, is there a reasonable time frame within that's resolved? But there's so many other things outside of your company, your tech company, that are also services. We've already touched upon it, right? Restaurants and retail. Uh, that's actually called the service industry. And things like public transportation is clearly a service being provided to people. And uh, I actually know some people that work at transit agencies that have their own kind of SLOs. They track how often their subway or, or, or buses, how often those transportation vehicles are arriving on schedule. How often are they late? And again, like everything else, they're rational people. They understand the bus can't always show up at that bus stop at the exact right time there's traffic and there's all sorts of other things that can happen, you know? And so they just ensure that they're aiming for buses to show up at the right percentage of time. They're doing SLOs, even if they don't call them that directly. Uh, social services fall into this as well. Even things like your dog walker, right? Like my dog's whining behind me right now. And, uh, you know, your dog walker aims to show up at a certain time every day. And sometimes they just can't. And again, you're cool with that as long as they show up on the scheduled time often enough. So let's talk about the second principle. Your users determine what reliable means. Again, this is, you know, it's up to your users and customers to actually tell you how things are going. Um, again, internal metrics don't matter here if they're not telling the story. If your internal metrics don't line up with what your customer experience is, then you're not measuring the right things. And let's drill down on the important word in this principle, which is what does reliable actually mean? So we're just going to go to the dictionary again, because I think it's a pretty decent definition. Reliable is to be consistently good in quality or performance and able to be trusted. So consistently being good in performance. Well, again, the overarching way to talk about this is are you doing what your users need you to do? And for computer services, we often think about things like error rates and latency. Um, are you responding to requests quick enough, whatever those requests might look like? Uh, consistency, um, is data being asked for uh, the correct data? Um, are you sending people, you know, if you're uh, uh, like an email vendor, um, if people read the same email twice, it does it have the same text in it. Um, and you also need to make sure that user journeys are being measured. Right. Your computer services are more than just error rates and latency. Uh, you need to make sure that you are capturing what users interacting with your service actually need you to be measuring. And so let's go to other reliability concerns. I'm just talking about things like customer support and internal IT. And you can think of all these things in the same manner. Um, you can make sure that not just are things uh, you know operating well enough uh, enough of the time, but how do people actually feel about it? How do the people that depend on these teams, whether they be external external customers or internal employees, are you being reliable enough for what they actually need as opposed to what you think you should be measuring? And again, we'll talk about these four other external non-tech things. Uh, these things also need to be reliable, right? Uh, as we talked about earlier, a restaurant that's not reliable for its customers is not doing a good job and it's not going to have happy customers. And same thing with public transport right? Uh, people are going to abandon it and end up buying a car if they have to, or do whatever they need to, if they can't get from point A to point B in, in, in a reasonable manner. And if your dog walker is always showing up way too late, you're going to switch to a different dog walker. And finally, the last principle, nothing works all the time, so don't aim for it. And I want to reword this one a little bit. And this is the kind of implication of that principle is that users have tolerance for failure. And just think about your own life. 
we can talk about a restaurant where you go and you order and you get the wrong dish. Kind of sucks, but as long as they send out the right dish in the right amount of time, you're not going to abandon that restaurant forever, as long as they don't send out the wrong dish every single time. Or for a computer service, imagine a streaming video service, for example. You know, uh, if the movie doesn't start in a reasonable manner or doesn't start at all, again, you're fine with that, as long as most of the time the movie you want to watch does start. Because people are okay if stuff isn't perfect. Nothing in the world is. And people have already internalized this. Humans are cool about that. You just need to be good enough, no matter what your service looks like. So let's drill down into, I think, what the important word here in this principle, at least the reworded implied principle, really means. Intolerance, the ability or willingness to tolerate something. Uh, it's exactly what we're just talking about. The fact that people are actually okay if things aren't perfect all the time. People expect this and people don't need you to aim for perfection. So stop burning yourself out by trying to do so. And we can talk about our general computer service failures again. We could, this list could be infinitely long, but you know, the common things, errors, you can't have too many errors. People are fine with some, uh, whether the user is another service that just needs to retry or to user literally, again, we'll go with a retail website uh, examples, trying to check out and can't. They're cool with that as long as they can check out later. Um, bad latency isn't great, right? Someone's trying to browse your website or use your API and the responses are too slow. Again, that's fine. As long as the responses aren't too slow all the time. And we can also talk about things like the wrong data format and data inconsistency. And we'll talk about these same other issues, right? Again, we'll talk about these other services that your company likely has that aren't strictly computer services, right? How much uh, can your customers, what is their tolerance for how often customers, customer support is too busy to answer the phone, right? Uh, what is the length of time that your customers are willing to sit in a queue? Um, you know, with your vendors, uh, how much can you tolerate them not responding correctly? And again, this is also totally true about all these other industries. These other services, they also absorb failures. Like we talked about earlier, if a restaurant brings you the wrong bill, that's fine. Uh, as long as they don't bring you the wrong bill every time. Public transportation, again, if a bus doesn't show up on time, that's cool. As long as it doesn't show up too late every single time. So I hope that this is just kind of a way to help people think about the fact that service level objectives are just a philosophy and they apply to everything. And people might primarily use them for their web API services, their request and response, uh, things where it's easy to measure errors and latency. And I don't mean to imply that measuring all these other conceptual things we've talked about would be easy, but that's also fine. Your math doesn't have to be super accurate as long as you're thinking about things in the right way. Computer services require pretty detailed math. They often like, require special monitoring systems and telemetry gathering systems, and they need systems to do the actual SLO math for you. And that's how that works. But not every service is a web API. Think about your users. That's the most important thing. Ensure that you're thinking about your users for every service you have. Remember that a lot of your services aren't computer services and use an SLO based approach to make those more reliable for your users as well. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Alex. That was a really good example to show SLOs in, in a way that everybody can grasp them. I find that really interesting and uh, there's, there's also people in the chat thanking you for your talk and, and there is applause going on there. So yeah, people really <laughs> like your talk. Um, audience, if you have any questions, post them now. We have, do we have a little bit of time? Yes, we do. We have, we have a quick minute to talk. There's more applause. <laughs> <laughs> You can also come find me on Twitter if you ever have any questions. I try to respond to anyone that's ever uh, that ever asks me there. So it's A E Dalgo S R E. Very cool. Uh, you will also be in the chat for a couple of minutes, Alex. Absolutely. Great. 
Okay, then uh, I want to thank you very much for your talk. Uh, it gave me flashbacks <laughs> to working in a restaurant. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm really happy I'm in tech now. How about you? Well, thanks so much for having me. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Alex. Uh, and thank you so much for your talk. Thanks so much for having me. Bye, Alex. Bye. Okay. Ed, I think uh, Alex is going to be in, in the chat to answer your question. So uh, hopefully he can take care of that there. Um, everybody, we're at the end of the track. That was it. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Uh, I had a really great time. And I hope you really like the reliability track and that you got some, uh, something out of it. And I think we had some great talks, so I hope you learned something cool uh, and had fun with us. So now I would like to send you all over to the closing keynote, which will happen in 14 minutes. So you have a tiny bit of time, get yourself some refreshments. And please come back for the closing keynote, which will be on track number one, uh, as per usual. So you will also get a little pop-up window here in a couple of minutes uh, for the closing keynote. So yeah, I hope you had a great time. I hope you enjoyed the conference. I hope you go and watch the, uh, the final keynote and our closing remarks. And yeah, see you next time and have a wonderful evening afternoon wherever you are i'm gonna have a nice evening now and i will see you all next time bye everybody